All right. Uh, hi, I'm Andreas. Uh, I'm in the Enterprise Customer Intelligence Org at Capital One. We are a horizontal platform team. We create platforms to process data from the entire enterprise and uh, compute insights and, again, deliver them to internal customers all across the company. Uh, a few people from my team are here. You've maybe seen some of us with the Capital One t-shirts walking around the sessions. Uh, there's some hands back there. Uh, I'm wearing my Capital One Coders t-shirt today. That's uh, our volunteer uh, work where we teach middle school kids coding uh, up to the point where they write their own first mobile app, which is really fun. So I'm going to be talking about stream processing design patterns, uh, basically how we think about streaming and how we use that to deliver an exceptional personalization experience to our customers at Capital One. So let's start from the customer because that's what we care about. Let's say you're a customer here on the left and you're clicking around on our web page and you're looking for some specific information and you find, oh, oops, I'm back on the home page. What happened? I'm kind of moving around in circles. Uh, let me just call and, and see if I can get some help. And then on the right, we have our uh, support representative who's going to say, um, yeah, hey, customer, please tell me what you were trying to do because I have no idea what you just did, even though the cu customer was just interacting with us uh, as a company through our web page. And then the representative finds out, yeah, this is kind of a special case. Let me connect you to my colleague here. And that colleague says, uh, hey, excuse me, but can we just rewind and start from the beginning and just tell me exactly what you're trying to do? And at this point, the customer is probably mildly irritated. Uh, and I feel for our representative on the right here because um, he's trying to make the customer happy. Um, and through no fault of his own, the customer is already a little bit unhappy at this point. And so uh, maybe I can ask for a show of hands, who's never had a customer service experience like that? It's pretty common, right? And as engineers, who has ever thought that in the age of network computers, it doesn't need to be that way? Yeah, and, and you're right, and, and we think so too, which is why we built these platforms. Uh, so uh, I'll give you a very uh, simple example to start with, uh, which is uh, we have some interaction coming from the customer and we uh, add some additional information and then uh, from here we can say, hey, there's this information available to you. And this is how we collect information. Uh, we, we have basically a REST server, which is called our uh, collector. Then we persist the data into Kafka from where we can uh, send it into different directions. And uh, at the top right from Kafka, you see the enricher. And this is a stateless process where we add some additional information. And then we have SDP, which is the streaming data platform, which is a company-wide uh, again, horizontal platform where we publish the data for real-time streaming uh, consumers and we also persist the data into data warehouses. You can see Snowflake and, and Redshift here in the picture so that analysts can consume this data. So let's see, what, what, what does an enricher look like? It's a stateless process. Uh, it's the simplest thing you can do with uh, scalable frameworks like Spark Streaming, Flink, Kafka Streams, or you just send a bunch of jars into a cluster. They don't need to know about each other because they will take each individual piece of data, do some computation with it, and then output whatever the result was. So uh, this is going to be my, my symbol for a compute node. Uh, it's kind of this Turing machine looking thing that has an input stream and some output. And you can do some simple mappings, like uh, you can remove sensitive information to protect your customer's privacy. Uh, you can uh, filter things that are relevant to you and um, not worry about having to consume everything on your consumer end. Uh, and like we just discussed, you can enrich. I'm not going to be talking about any programming. If you're interested in that, if you uh, have less experience with uh, streaming frameworks, you can uh, take a look at this link down here. Uh, bit.ly slash simple transformations. Uh, I simply cloned uh, an example of a, a Flink uh, job and added some very simple examples for you to look at uh, where I'm doing some maps and filters and some unions. 
Um, but take note, uh, this is the extent of what you can do with stateless job. As soon as you want to do any joins, they will have to become windowed because you have an infinite data set in a stream. And if you do any reduce, then of course you also need to store the intermediate result so it becomes stateful again. And then we have to think a little bit harder. Oh, and uh, I wanted to show you on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, I'm going to be using some qualitative um, measures here to uh, talk about how we think about the performance of these approaches. And here in this case is going to be our baseline. So we're going to say this is low latency. We do everything one by one. And uh, our throughput is going to be pretty high. And we don't need to store anything. So we have very little memory usage. So let's, let's go to a more interesting example where we actually want to store a few of the most recent interactions for our customer so that then our representative can say something like, oh yeah, I see what you're doing. Um, let me help you out and, and guide you along the next step. What's more is, um, this is this is the example where our customer decided to call. What we can also do is we can offer a personalized assistant to every customer because we're already computing this for everyone. So why not? So uh, here again, we can store the interactions and do something with that. And we can tell the customer, um, here are some options. I think you're interested in this kind of stuff. Um, check it out. And then the customer has, has a very easy path to reach the information that they're looking for. And so very simple way to do that in a stream processor is using internal state, which means that within the processor, you're going to use a lot of memory, which you can see here on the right, to stack up all those interactions from recent times. You want to sort them maybe by customer, so they're all kind of grouped together. And grouping things together will require shuffling them through the network in your cluster. So there's going to be some network use, uh, which is going to push your latency up. And um, some frameworks. Uh, give you a really cool uh, possibility to actually query the internal state. So you can talk to an endpoint in your compute cluster and say, hey, what's the state right now? Which is really nice. So your, your processor can kind of serve as your, as your key value database at the same time. Uh, the other way to, to deal with this and perhaps try to avoid shuffling your data across the network between your compute nodes is use an external state. If you are looking for high performance. You can use something like Redis or RocksDB. Um, we're going to keep the memory usage low, um, which makes it, I'm sorry, which makes it cost effective. Ooh, I went all the way. Here we go. Which makes it uh, more cost effective on your compute cluster. And uh, you don't have to shuffle, but you can just push into your, into your state here. So you saw already in the, in the diagram, we had a Kafka cluster in the middle as a message broker. Another way to avoid shuffling between your compute nodes is to try sending the data where it belongs, all to the same spot. And the way you can do that is producing it into Kafka with a key that is relevant to your computation that you want to do. Then they will already end up on the same nodes because one Kafka partition translates to one task in your processor. And then you can maybe do some uh, reduction on the data already before you push it into an external state. So then you reduce the, the network load because you already reduced down the data somewhat. But you have to take into account that the tasks can be rescheduled in case of failure or just because your scheduler decided to do that, uh, if you have back pressure or something like that. So you cannot rely on things that belong together always being in the same place, which is why I'm showing you a design here with an external state, which um, will be the target where everything comes back together if it has been separated. And so for, for thinking about Kafka, uh, depends on your business problem. Maybe you have a small trickle of data for a lot of different streams. In which case, uh, for example, business workflows, uh, in which case uh, you have a picture like here on the top, we have a kind of a rainbow of different uh, things that are happening on your Kafka cluster. And in this case, if you have a ton of partitions in each topic, 
then any failure in Kafka will trigger a long pause to re-elect leaders for your partitions. So it's probably a good idea for this kind of applications to have very few partitions for each topic. Uh, we have a, the opposite situation where we have one big stream of a lot of data. And in that case, we have to think about uh, downstream, what happens downstream in our compute cluster where uh, we want to be able to scale up and the number of partitions gives the number of tasks, as I just mentioned. And so your concurrency is given by the number of topic partitions in Kafka. So you probably want to use a somewhat higher number of partitions, which is kind of the, the image on the, on the bottom. So you still have a lot of partitions, but only one topic. So now, working around failure requires recovering from failure. And in a stateful task, that means that when you just crash, your in-memory state is gone, and you might have a completely new instance. Uh, we work a lot of, with AWS. So you have to rebuild the state, or you can reload it. And that's why checkpointing exists. Uh, all frameworks have some sort of checkpointing functionality. And again, this takes time uh, in order to recover from this. So your latency might be inconsistent. And so this is kind of a topic where uh, we as engineers think about this and we, we're kind of aware of this, um, but we need to communicate it to our uh, data consumers, uh, in our case in-house, and to everybody who's designing the product to make sure that everybody can plan around these short pauses. And I've, I've shown here uh, in the green arrows that maybe at first we have some regular output at a regular interval, and then we're kind of shrugging sorry, nothing right now, and then we have a bunch of output and uh, we catch up and then we're back to normal, right? So in this case, if we have a bot that's giving our customers some useful, cool information, we need to be able to have some heuristics or some default, as you've seen this morning uh, in the talk uh, from the Netflix recommendation system, they always have fallbacks for, for uh, what they recommend, and in this case, uh, it's the same thing, uh, it's a general general challenge, of course. So then uh, when you think about failure tolerance, you also have to think about um, at least once processing versus uh, exactly once processing. So when you fail, you might have just produced a bunch of outputs. You reload your checkpoint that recreates re, uh, your state, but the state is from several outputs ago. So you start processing and churning away and you create outputs again. And now you have a few outputs that you have created twice. And that's at least once processing. Uh, it works fine, it's resilient. You have at least produced some output. Uh, you haven't lost anything. But your consumer needs to be prepared. So if your consumer is not prepared, uh, you need to do exactly once processing. And that's pretty challenging because you would add, uh, either have to checkpoint after each output so that when you roll back, you don't replay anything that you just did, or you have to batch your outputs together and only when you produce a bunch of outputs, you checkpoint then, exactly then. In that case, you're not gonna have low latency, right? So if you're looking for real-time applications, that's not the way to go. If you're checkpointing all the time, you're not gonna have a lot of capacity. So it's maybe not the best idea. What's better is to use item potent designs, and that's also been mentioned today. Uh, so I wanted to just make that super obvious. Uh, that just means we have an ID, ID on, on every uh, message or every item of data, and then we can uh, issue that into our output, and then on the receiver's end, we don't say, hey, I have this bank transaction, um, some money went off my bank account, and then the same transaction happened again? No, we don't want that, right? We don't want to lose the money twice. We have transaction number one, two, three, four, five, and then one, two, three, four, five comes in again, and we see, oh yeah, we already did that one. So here's another customer experience, and I'll, I'll do another vote later uh, if you've seen this. Uh, so this is pretty common when you have a mobile browser, and it's so common that uh, Randall Monroe made, a, made an XKCD comic about this. Uh, so to amuse you, I'm gonna read that out for you right now. Um, so this is a server talking and saying, hi, I'm a server, who are you? 
and we have a mobile phone answering, I'm a browser, I'd like to see this article. Oh boy, I can help. Let me get it for, whoa, you're a smartphone browser? Yeah? Cool. Hey, I've got this new mobile version of my site, check it out. Isn't it pretty? Sure, but this is just your mobile site's main page version of my site. Um, where's the article I wanted? What article? The one I, who are you? I, hi, I'm a server. So, um, hands up, who has seen this before? <laughs> I've seen this before many times. What does this mean? It means you had a customer who was interested in your product if you're doing business. They can't find your product. You lost the sale. You have not very good customer relationship at this point, And you lose a reputation. So you want to avoid that. And what's more, uh, in today's world of viral videos and um, products being seen all over movies, uh, something's mentioned on the news, you can have sudden changes in interest in some of your products. What do you want to have on your main homepage? You want to have the product that most people are interested in right now, right? So you want to have real-time alerting because this can happen really quickly. So what do we do in stream processing? When we have a challenge like this, we want to count rates of interest per time unit. Let's say something's involving sessions. What is a session? It's a 30-minute period. And we want to count some, some user interactions. So maybe we have a windowing uh, counter, a windowing average, and we're saying, oh yeah, after one hour I can tell you what happened. Maybe it's too late. Maybe all the customers went straight to your website, didn't find your product, they left. It's one hour, one hour ago. You find out there was this interest, you put the thing there, nobody cares anymore. So you want to know a little bit sooner, right? So um, here in this, this example, I'm showing a rapid change in, in interest from kind of green through yellow to red. And at the end of the green interval, we're saying, oh yeah, everything's green and it's not anymore. So what you want to do is you want to produce more output. You want to let everybody know what's going on right now, what's happening recently, uh, just like you have some work to do um, that takes maybe a month. You don't say, oh yeah, after one month it's done. You say, what's my progress after a few days, right? So same thing here. And you can upsert your, your current view of the world into some state and extrapolate what would you expect to be seeing after that one hour, which is your window. And you can trigger your alarms early and say, hey, there's, there's a lot of these red things coming in. Maybe we should do something about it. And in that case, um, we can push our latency way down because we, before, when we wait for the entire window to close, uh, our latency is way up. And of course, um, well, if we have an internal state, we use a lot of memory or we use an external state here. So uh, in, in total, um, we have to design around pauses. We want low latency. And we make our design decisions accordingly. So even when we do design for low latency, when we have resilient and distributed applications, we will have some restart pauses that we have to work through and we're gonna have some catch-up bursts. And our data consumers need to plan uh, with fallback uh, in place to bridge these pauses. And we can carefully design our streaming applications to fulfill our business needs for uh, latency compared to throughput, compared to cost. And we can output as a stream to sophisticated data customers who can read streams or into a query real state, or into, a, into a, an analytics database. And uh, you've seen internal and external states for aggregations. Um, we talked about data locality, which, which can reduce your latency. And we talked about windowing, where alerting early really helps uh, to not have to wait for that window to close, which can be a window of opportunity. So um, for all of this, I wrote a little cheat sheet that we can quickly go through. So uh, stateless is our baseline. If we have an internal state, then we're gonna use a lot of memory. Our uh, latency is gonna go a little bit higher. External state, we have to talk to it. Latency goes up. 
but we don't need any internal memory anymore. Uh, if we can localize our data, for example, by keying our data into Kafka, uh, we can reduce the latency back down again. If we want to do exactly once processing, that's going to be very challenging. We're going to have somewhat higher latency, reduced throughput. But if we design with item potency in mind, we can get that latency down again. And again, windowing means we have to wait for the window to close. Uh, it's a stateful process, so it's going to consume memory. But if we output all the time, uh, we're going to use a lot of network, so that's going to reduce our throughput somewhat. But we can get our latency way, way down. And that's, that's what we would want in some applications, right? So you have to choose the right one out of these options. So uh, here's an application. So uh, pretty soon, Couple One's chatbot Eno is going to roll out uh, the quick reply model, which is essentially a personalized uh, number of options that you get from your chatbot for what you might want to be doing next. And this is based on your previous interactions as a customer with us, so you don't have to call us, you don't have to ask, you don't have to describe what you're doing. Um, you just interacted with us, you just gave us that information. We should know, right? And so this is going to uh, be released in waves if you're a Capital One customer. Uh, check your, your app and check your Eno chatbot. This is one of many applications. The call center application is also something that's in preparation. And uh, many, many more are being worked on, which is why we're hiring engineers, data scientists, and tech managers. So please get in touch or with, with me or with any of our friendly colleagues with the Capital One t-shirts. Uh, we have office hours in room 302 from 2 o'clock right after this. Uh, we also have a booth outside where you can get some swag. Uh, so please come see us if you're interested or to just chat about stream processing. If you have any other ideas for how to extend this list, that would be interesting too. Thanks very much. Thank you. That was a great presentation. I was wondering how uh, this is kind of open-ended, maybe out of the scope of this presentation. But I was wondering if, if you have any, if you if you had to draw, if you had to kind of pick one, do you have a preference towards Flink or Spark with some kind of streaming layer wrapped around it? I gave my microphone away, so I'm going to be back here. So. Um, uh, there are a lot of dimensions to this question. One dimension is um, hiring engineers who are good with that framework, uh, which certainly is easier for Spark. Uh, at the end of the day, the concepts are the same, so it's not super important as a, as a bullet point. Um, you can learn Flink pretty easily as well. Uh, Spark uh, has some nice convenience functionality around uh, Spark SQL which makes a few things easy. Um, and you can use the SQL optimizer that will give you some uh, pretty nice, fast execution for some things that you might want to be doing. Um, the question about latency is the other way around. So in that case, uh, Flink would win. Flink is designed with streaming in mind from the ground up. So everything is a stream. And internally, hidden from view for you as a programmer, there is some micro-batching going on just for speed. But it happens on the very short millisecond scale. So you don't really see it. Uh, so you'll, you can reach, the, reach levels like 20 millisecond latency. Whereas with Spark, you essentially start a new Spark job with each micro-batch which means you can't push the latency arbitrarily low. You can get as low as maybe 200 milliseconds, but if you try to push further and just throw capacity at the problem, you're not going to get anywhere because of the overhead of starting these Spark jobs uh, for every micro-batch. Any other questions? But there is a, just to, mm -hmm. just to finish that, there is a, there's a Spark streaming engine specifically uh, that was developed by Databricks that um, avoids this. So they, there is a parallel development. And I think it's it planned to be 
released into open source Spark with some version in the future.